ready? All right. So thank you, Susie. I appreciate being brought out here. Uh, what this training is about is a program that's being done in Basalt. This is the first time it's been uh, incorporated into a municipal uh, setting. And what it is is using the Zero Energy Ready Home template as a uh, alternative path to a certificate of occupancy in the same way that lead homes or passive house homes, you can bypass all your uh, other building department codes and things like that through the certification. So uh, I've been doing, uh, well I'm with About Saving Heat, I'm here with Dennis, our, our fearless leader. He's done over uh, 30,000 retrofits over the past 40 years, since about 1975. I've done about 1,000. Um, I've worked, uh, a couple of years ago, I did 400 units for the city of Aspen, retrofits. I'm working on another 500 units this year. Uh, as a build And what we focus on is building optimization and retrofits. So I'm the guy that comes in 20 years later and sees how well the house turns out. And this is where I find a lot of uh, problems, not due to the builders, but due to the building codes, because if you don't require it, it doesn't get done. My first introduction to high performance buildings was in 1956. My father was a spec builder, and uh, he did the all American truth of if a little's good, a lot's better. And he stuffed the two by four walls in our home. And this was in uh, San Fernando Valley where it'd get up 100, 110 during the summer is an unusual. And he packed the two by four uh, walls with eight inches of insulation. He put 12 inches of insulation in the attic. And it's basically, he hit the two, 2015 IEC code in 1956 and didn't even know it. So I've always been aware of how effective simple steps uh, can be. And what we found was the house would never get much over 75 degrees during the hottest of summers. And this was pre-air conditioning. And I'd go to my friend's house, this would be 85, 90 in their house. And then I'd go back home and it was really quite amazing. So that was something always in my mind. Uh, when I built my own house, I had R50 walls. I could barely get the house off of 70 degrees uh, summer or winter. And my heating bills, or my gas bills, were 70% uh, lower than my neighbors. So, and this was all done not with high scientific or anything, just simple, simple building practices that all builders can understand. Uh, the zero energy ready, am I losing something? It's timing out on me. Just about ready to get started. So, the thing I like about the Zero Energy Ready program is it's code based. You go into LEED, Passive House, a lot of these other different ones, it's, there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of new learning, and you're going to have some guy looking over your shoulder telling you what you're doing right or wrong. Zero Energy Ready is just following code with better practices at a slightly higher level, and that's how we're going to get started. So, most of what I'm talking about is geared towards new builds. But everything that I, the, the basic pillars of the information are uh, good for any type of building and retrofits. And, and, and if you have any questions as they go along, please feel free to speak up and, and we can go over it real quick. But the big uh, point that I want you to understand is how quickly things change. Here we have 1900 and within 13 years it went from all horse and buggies except for one electric car, which I like to always say, to all vehicles, and, and that was over 100 years ago. And it changes, is getting quicker and quicker, as you know, just think back 10 years of what you were doing with your phone. Mm -hmm. And here's the big takeaway on this, is millennials are now over half of the new buying public. Everybody considered them hanging out in attics and crawl spaces at their parents' houses. But really, uh, the boomers are now retiring, they're downsizing, and uh, so the real big thing is, is in the same way they don't look for the biggest desktop, they look for the smallest phone. 
and they get they're looking for efficiency that, and, and so that is really a key component of what's moving forward uh, here's a here's walking mountain science this is a, a survey they did 75 percent of homeowners they want it all in now they don't want to be given a home and saying Yes, I put a PVC pipe from the attic down to the mechanical room. You're ready for solar. Yeah, then you've got to buy solar. And then you've got to refinance seconds, credit cards, turn in your kids' college loans. So it becomes very unlikely that you're going to do it. And this is what I'm going to be talking about is how you can put all these pieces together. But, but as most of us as builders, when we get some architect who's brought in an engineer and they say, we're going to go high performance. This is something that you get handed off to you. And you go, well, okay, yeah, right. Who's going to carry me through that? So what I want to get you to understand is with the Zero Energy Ready program, this is one of their brochures. They have all the pieces of the puzzle set up for you so that you can become one of the top 1% of builders in the country. Uh, this brochure, you can see there's a green, blue, and gray. The green bar is a zero energy ready home. Blue is an uh, energy star. And then the gray one is a typical house that is on the market today. The big thing that I found and, and heard from most builders was I went ahead and did all these steps, but I never got my money back. Nobody cared. Nobody understood. And this is what uh, the Department of Energy figured out, and they rectified. So now you have the badging of everything you've done on this house when they walk in. They have brochures, they have case studies, they have uh, videos. So when you're selling a house, you really have a lot of information. And most of all, when you see, when uh, potential buyers are driving around with a realtor and they see zero energy on the uh, side of the street, they're going to dive in there and they're going to look at it. So what they've done is they simplified it down to some basic checklists so, so you can get into it without getting a giant, I don't know if anybody's done passive house or leave, but just a book of gobbledygook. And what they do is take you through every step in a very, very simple way. They have the solution center. So when you do get to that step and you say, okay, what... I'm at this point in the building process, what do I want? And then you push on one of these buttons on the carousel, and they have everything you need from uh, uh, CAD galleries that you can actually put into your phone or into your tablet, and you can go out and you can show your subs, or you can go in and check on the work and make sure everything's done properly. They have the checklist, so you do the proper steps at the proper time. So they really carry you through the whole process and don't just hand you the uh, instruction books that we never look at and, and then just try and get lost. So the big thing is we need to understand what's going on with building codes. And what we know is, is that the plan uh, is to have uh, zero energy uh, building codes by 2030. And we get them every three years. We're, we're already in the 2018, and as I think, Susie, we're at uh, 2015 code here. In the, I'm in the Roaring Fork Valley. We've got three counties in our valley. Everybody's in the 2015 code. But home rule. Everybody picks and chooses how they want their 2015 code to be done. Some places are going to have a board or other places are going to have a duck flat. Some places aren't going to have any of it because they just pick and choose off the menu of what they consider their 2015 code. So here's what it's going to look like. And as you see the zero energy ready, you see this big long list and you think it's really a lot of stuff. Well, if you go through it from the solar ready, well, that's the BDC pipe going in the mechanical room. Uh, I go beyond that, but the uh, efficient component is Energy Star appliances, EPA indoor packages, good filtration, higher filter, uh, uh, HEPA filters in what's normal, ducts in, in uh, conditions space, no big deal, uh, HVAC with whole house ventilation. Let's get some fresh air in these houses because furnaces and AC systems are closed systems and you're just recycling all the air. 
and the big change for indoor air quality is to get some fresh air into the system. So we have water management, independent verification, and, and I point towards HERS, uh, uh, HERS uh, certifiers. And it's the same thing as getting your engineer on your program. He's going to show you how it's all done. And what's great is you take the plans in, he looks it over. If you're going for the certification, he'll tell you where you're missing it. He'll point to ways you can get to it. So you've got this huge support on uh, getting uh, through the work. So what you'll see is that the bottom two red lines. The bottom one is your uh, zero energy ready. The one right above it is the 2015 IECC. So you look at that and you go, wow, that's just a little bit better than the 2015 IECC. So why do I want to go through another program when I can just go to the building department and do it? Because in a 500 or a 5 million uh, home sale survey, they found that any type of certification that home buyers were willingly paying a 10% premium. If you're doing a $500,000 house, $50,000 practically paid for all your energy upgrades just on that. But wait, there's more. We've got builders are, are really getting, um, uh, are growing fond of using uh, green certification because they're seeing how it's done. In 2016, 200,000 homes are certified with HERS uh, ratings. 2018 is on, um, uh, on the path of possibly doubling that. So, positive energy homes, I go beyond just being zero ready, and this is the financing portion of it that I'd like to talk to you about, because what you want to do is bundle everything into the house in the first place, put it on a 30-year loan. That's your least cost, that's your lowest interest rates, and as you'll see, it all works together. So the main reason that, uh, that my company that we're called into a home is either uh, uh, comfort issues or energy bills being way, way out of control. And all of these come through weak building codes. Uh, again, we've got local uh, communities that are making pledges all around Colorado. They're moving in. in uh, so we know the push is going that way. You can either fight it, drag your feet, work against it, or you can use this program, step up a little half step more than what you're doing with code, and really get all these benefits. 85% of U.S. energy is considered waste from extraction, transportation, processing, production, transmission, and leaky homes. Only 15% of what we have in the ground is making it, making your home more comfortable. Uh, Shell Oil and Duke Energy CEOs, they were at a fossil fuel convention and they were the keynote speakers. They stood up there together and said, the future is all electric and it's going to be solar. Why? Free fuel. Buying a gas furnace and buying a solar system, this is my plug to you, Matt, is about the same price. The difference is gas, you're paying for fuel. Solar, you're, you're just looking up at the sun. Uh, all the investments, the big money's all going towards zero carbon uh, investments. And uh, even more, they've uh, doubled just in the last few years what's being uh, put into efficiency. Here you can see where the uh, peak oil is peaked. The blue bars shows you what is uh, approved resources, what they say we know's in the ground. And then the red line is new discovered. And as you can see on the far right in 2016, there wasn't a lot left in the ground and there wasn't a lot left being discovered. So new energy, uh, electric energy generation, we all feel that, oh, it's natural gas. We've got all this, this stuff going on and it's all natural gas. Well, natural gas is kind of a, a loss. It's, with oil, it's really easy. You've got a, a, a bowl of of liquid and you can suck it out quite easily. Natural gas is like walking into this room with a straw and trying to suck out all the air out of the place. It's very, very difficult and it drops off very quickly. So natural gas wells within a few years of discovery are, are falling off 
precipitously, and new generation investments know about that. The blue shows you renewables, and you can see that in 2016, 21 gigawatts of new renewable electrical generation compared to seven for gas and none for coal. So the direction we're going is renewables, and renewables are going to solar. Everybody looks at all the big wind farms out to sea, everywhere you see these 500 foot uh, turbines out there, but now uh, the, the wind is in blue, solar is in yellow, and what they're finding out is wind is mechanical. Gears wear out, generators wear out, spinning crops wear out. So that is a huge uh, 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 future cost. When you go into uh, uh, solar, it's basically a window aimed at the sun. So here you see the last, uh, from 2005 to 2015, on the left side is the brown, that was all coal generation. Uh, natural gas is the uh, orange, and then the blue, look at us, Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming, are moving strongly into renewables as uh, uh, the deal. So here's what it looks like when you get these big solar fields. They really don't impact the land, and now they're coming up with some new strategies similar to what's being done in the farmland with uh, wind, is that they figured out a way that they can actually uh, increase profits of the land for farmers by 60% by adding solar panels in a way that the, the land is still free, the animals still roam, and they can still get all their tractors underneath it, and they get a lot of solar energy. Uh, and the big thing is, what do you do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? You put it in batteries. <coughs> Tesla did a 135 megawatt system in, in Australia. And um, he, if we were going to put in a new gas uh, generation, it could take years to be installed. He installed it in 90 days. The savings that they made on what they call peaking and, and frequency uh, adjustments to the line, they, the utility company was paying $500,000 a day to keep a gas turbine running. When they put these batteries in, they changed it over and they had a three year payback for the whole system and after that it was free. <coughs> so batteries started just as putting them in your flashlight and playing with toys. It's gone on to home storage and now into grid and, and battery storage. And you can see with an electric vehicle there's over 2,000 parts of the drive train of a fossil fuel vehicle and about 200 in an electric vehicle. And what you find is the light green is a electric vehicle maintenance cost against a fossil fuel maintenance cost. And it's about a third of the cost. So as consumers start finding out this information, it, this change factor is going to be huge and quick. And understanding how to do the building of this and putting it all together is going to be really the, the marketing and, and um, uh, sales tool for you in the end. I was just down in San Diego speaking, and uh, there is a gentleman there that is actually doing apartment buildings, and he's installing two-way chargers. These are off-the-shelf units that, from Nissan. You can only buy them in Canada. Don't ask me why, but they're not being sold here yet. But he brought them down, he's in Washington, brought them down across the border. I guess he smoked them. Uh, and uh, he put it in there, and again, in the same way the batteries was getting frequency and things, he was making money on top of everything else by using these systems. Uh, Colorado Realtors are now adding the home energy scores to their MLS. Uh, and so as builders, we have this huge opportunity of 70% for commercial, residential, and transportation. Most commercial is small commercial, like the buildings we're in right here. It's not about skyscrapers. And most of us as builders are working on things of the uh, commercial size, anywhere from five to 50 or 60,000 square feet, not real, real big. So we have an opportunity to uh, really impact all that. And as you see over on the red is the energy efficiency cost of unbelievably zero to 
uh, four cents a kilowatt hour, and it's the highest price for energy efficiency is lower than the lowest price for any other form of energy. So let's go through the money. When you go by the numbers, this was a study done, and that was using a 2006 IEC standard built house, which was for hers, it's kind of the benchmark of the bottom of efficiency. And so what they had was a house was, char it was costing $3,000 a year to heat and cool. Um, so with the upgrades, they invested $20,000, but put it in the loan. So at 4.5%, it was about $1,200 a year, $100 a month, to pay for the upgrades. But it had a proven savings of $2,200. So what happens is, is at the end of the year, you get 1000 So anybody, a, a banker or an accountant here, the first thing they always say is, 20-year payback, I don't care. But wait, let's reinvest. When you put it into a solar, uh, what you can find is, is a, a, a $25,000 investment, and this is after your any rebates and any uh, tax credits and things like this. I know you don't have the same rebates we have in my area, but this is a general statement about showing how extending it in 30 years, reducing the interest rates, makes this a payback for uh, uh, this process. So what it comes out is, is that uh, the 30-year investment is $1,400 a year. Interesting enough, if you have solar on your house, it costs you four cents a mile if, you're, if you have an electric vehicle. Millennials are gonna be eating this stuff up. Your fossil fuel call, and this is just medium. If you have an SUV or a big truck, it's gonna be possibly double that. But at the end of the day, the savings on solar, people uh, run about 15, 000, or 5,000 miles a year. Is about a, another thousand dollars. So here again, there's another savings by by bundling this all in. So you so the proposition to the the home buyer is: Do you want to buy a lot of barrels of fuel, or do you want to invest in an upgrade to the home? Who's going to uh, <clears throat> argue with the 97 percent return on investment, 10 percent resale premium? For a, for a certified home and getting a $1,500 a year extra in their pocket. Uh, 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 how can you argue with a $50,000 upgrade that's gonna pay for itself? So this is a pretty powerful um, piece of information that I've never seen anybody else really address. And, and this is something that if you can take this idea away with you, you'll see whether you do it now or later, you're going to start seeing this happen. We have the gentleman with Thrive coming in. They're doing all these homes already. You can, you can ask him some questions about it uh, also. So you know you're going to get a lot more than, than upgrading in countertops. And as builders, you know, you say, I, I can't afford to invest. Well, you can't afford to invest in granite countertops, but you have to, and you do, because you know that's what the buyer wants. This is not future projection. This is what's happening right now today, as you'll hear from the Thrive Builders. So here are your steps to success. This is what makes it really simple. Instead of going through and micromanaging every little piece of the puzzle, what we want to do is look at what are the big uh, pillars that you can stand your building on that makes it really, really simple to do it. So we're just looking about aiming at the sun, making sure it's sealed, exterior insulation, I'll get to that in a little bit, and good indoor air quality with either an energy recovery ventilation system or some kind of fresh air added to the home. And because once you seal it up, you just have to get fresh air into it. So here we are. How is it we can be in this cold, cold climate and still be doing okay? Because uh, our world is based on those basic principles. We've known about it for millennia. And it's just based on simple facts of how the sun rises and the sun sets, summer and winter. And here we have 
6,000 years ago, when the Chinese had building inspectors, and before you could build, you had to point out to him where the sun came up and came down. What they did was very interesting. All their homes were based on a layout, whether it's a small or a large home, or even the, their major palaces. Everybody had to have space for sun. It was rectilinear, aiming towards the sun, and nobody could shade their neighbors. Even when they laid out their subdivisions in towns, they used the same deal. Everybody had to have access to the sun. 3,000 years ago, the Greeks did the same thing. Here's an apartment building from uh, 3,000 years ago. It looks pretty much like a passive solar apartment building from today. Uh, and they did something that was a little bit different. They, or they angled off to the southeast. And what you'll see is on that, uh, the middle uh, graph is the south. And the problem with, with, as we all have been told, you got to aim it due south. But for heating and operational that way, and even since we are in a heating climate, we're going to want more energy in the morning. So kicking off to the southeast, you'll see the second graph. It shows sun comes up, house is flooded. I lived in a condominium that we had, it was cross-shaped. So we had each person was at a different compass point. I was on the southeast side. I, my energy bills were 50% less than my neighbor on due south. Because when he got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, he turned up the heat. When I got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, my house was already warm. And it wasn't super insulated. Past, it was just a standard, regular old house uh, condominium. So, and then again, you'll see at the one second from the bottom southwest, you're going to pick up a lot of energy at the end of the day. And this is a house. It's an exaggerated example, but this person aim the corner of his house to the south. He's got good eaves over the top, so during the summer he doesn't flood into the house. And so he's got morning sun, he's got afternoon sun, and the first thing most people say, it's going to be overheated, it's going to be too hot. But now with uh, proper eaves and spectrally selective coatings, we can uh, uh, work on reducing that amount considerably, and we can get to that point. So what do we do with our own house? Well, we basically, whoops, don't do, oh, I know what it was. We basically don't do that. We do this. All the long side is, ba is packed up against each other. The short side is covered by trees, and nothing is aiming me towards the sun. But then when we had a problem with the uh, 70s with the oil crisis, uh, our, our engineers and architects started from a... Uh, clean sheet of paper, didn't look into the past, and they did a lot of crazy stuff trying to figure out what they're doing, and what they found out was is that if you follow the basic prin principles of thermodynamics, you can build this. This is built in Durango. It's a zero energy certified home, uh, a HERS rating of 21. A certified HERS rating in our area, you only need to get 50. He brought it down to 21 because he put some solar panels on top. Again, putting all this stuff together, he now has a $420 per year propane bill for heating, washing dishes, clothes, cooking food, everything all in. That's not unusual, at least where I'm at, as a monthly heating bill. And it doesn't cost a lot. This is a passive house, so it's done for $200 or less than $200 a square foot. Here's a, a Habitat for Humanity that was done for $100 a square foot. And it, just remember, it's all free heat, free fuel. Here we go. Then the next portion is air sealing, air leakage. 40% of the heat just leaks out. In the 1990s, everybody loved ceiling lights. And so as you see all these ceiling lights around here, all they are little chimneys to your attics. And they're just lost going up into the floor above and, and beyond. And so uh, what we want to do is take care of this problem. I go out to a lot of people's homes. I do energy assessments. 
I come in and say, let's go over the report. And I've literally found people sitting under blankets because they're paying to melt the snow and, and develop ice dams over their house. This is a house I worked on. These people ended up having to do a uh, tear everything out down to the studs to find all the problems of the air leakage and bad insulation, just all kinds of uh, what I call code problems. So here it is, you just want to seal it tight. You have all this information. You have these details. Again, you can bring this on your tablet or your phone. You can look and make sure everything's done right. And here's the big takeaway on air sealing. Remember, right now, um, if you have to do a blower door for your CO, it doesn't need to be done until you want your CO. So the whole house is finished. You want to put the, the for sale sign in the, in the ground, and then you do it and find out it doesn't work. What you want to do is at the rough end. You get your doors, you get your windows, all your, your framing's open, there's no insulation. Uh, and then we come in with the blower door, we have a little thermal camera, and you're going to either visually see the holes or you're going to find them. And we get to passive house levels of, uh, uh, of air uh, barriers. Uh, really quite easily. So here are, here's my friend Floyd. The first time he wanted to do some air sealing, he had his little can, and he goes, oh boy, this sucks. And he started looking around and said, this is what I got to do everywhere I go. This is really killing me because wherever I look, there's air infiltration. But helps on the way. There's companies like... Uh, about saving heat, we focus on insulation and air sealing. You can go in here and do, based on, let's say, a 2,000 square foot house, we could go from the crawl space all the way up to the top plate and knock this out in about a half a day to a day, cost you another thousand dollars, but this just crushes energy loss, air infiltration, and really, uh, there's a study done on a Victorian house with no insulation, single pane, uh, uh, windows and they added no insulation they did no upgrades other than air sealing they did about 10 cases of of uh, caulk and foam but when they were done with it they cut the energy usage by half so air sealing is really the key uh, of, of crushing your energy loss so there so everywhere you look again you have the top plate and all around the walls going up into the attic you have over a mile of cracks so what it, it's really easy when you don't have any insulation up there, get a guy up there to seal all this stuff up. You know, now we have LED lights that are sealed, so all you gotta do is pop them into the, uh, the can and the, and the ceiling and just screw it in and it's totally sealed. And, and these, we put the top hats on because of overheating that will uh, destroy the lighting or the, the lighting um, uh, bulb. So uh, we've already gotten around that. Then you want to make sure that you uh, have your air sealed or air uh, open and, and baffles and everything laid out properly. This is the usual what we see when they go up into attics. And that's kind of typical of what everybody uses. They say, okay, I got soffit vents. I need a baffle. If they get these things. They're made with, uh, I think, recycled eight crates or egg cartons. They were really thin by when you blow it in, just the wind of blowing in cellulose will pull these off the walls. They're really bad. What we use is just a piece of cardboard, really isn't it that much more expensive, but it gives you that opportunity to dam up in front of your soffit vent, and then when you attach it to the rafters, you can allow that cool air in there, which is going to reduce your uh, ice damming and it's going to cool off your roof during the summer. And so this is what it looks like. It goes right across. Now you've got a huge area of air coming up through your soffit vents and it's, and it's flooding into your attic space. This really works. So once you get done doing that, you want to get down below and look at your uh, crawl space and, and your, uh, uh, your slabs. This is a slab that shows you uh, how hot it is. You can lose 60% of the heat out of a house just through a slab. So make sure you have everything insulated. 
Here's another one of the, these cheap and easy uh, techniques that will pay for all your energy efficiency upgrades. I use this on my own home, and what it is is a frost-protected shallow foundation. And the interesting thing is, uh, you're in pretty much the same altitude as us, and when you get up in the hills, we're, we go between three and four foot foundation to get below the freeze line. And so what you do is, You'll, you can do your foundation two feet down and then a piece of foam skirting the house two feet out is equal to going down an additional two feet. I did my own house, it was a two story, 2,000 square foot, so it was a 1,000 square foot slab. I, my uh, concrete contractor told me, save $30,000. Use it. It's legal. It's done. Doing slabs up here, go to any commercial building, they're all slabs. Nobody, yeah, show me a crawl space and it's a renovated residential home. So this is really, really huge to save this big money so you can invest into having heat recovery ventilation. You can invest in the adding more insulation and doing it right. So again, we have all the details. Everything's there. Go to the solution center. You know, key these things up. Go over to your concrete guy. Say, this is how I want it done. Guy that's laying foundation, show them. Go to your building department. This is what I'm doing. It's a legal thing. I did it myself. Uh, you know, so, but every town's different. You may have to talk to them. But usually what they'll say is, is show me someone else that's done it in a similar uh, climate and I'll let it go. So if you ever run into the problem, let me know and I'll be happy to help you out with that. And if you don't want to deal, deal, deal with details, you can get these prefab foundation pieces and just drop them down and, uh, and you're good to go. Again, more foundation details. So this is what we do. We do this a lot in retrofits. Uh, we'll go into crawl spaces and 70% of your energy loss is from air sucking in through your foundation vents and, and through your rim joist area, your mud sill, sucking up through the uh, uh, P-trap openings in the floor and the, in the uh, uh, subfloor, and then it all gets up into your walls, and you may have a convective loop that's going all the way up to the attic, sucking out. So all your interior perimeter walls are literally little huge chimneys moving air. Maybe not really fast, but it's moving air. So similar to if you've ever taken a straw and you stick it in a glass of water and you put your finger on top, there's no movement. That water just sits there. You gotta stop the movement and then, or you gotta seal it up and that will stop the movement. So we go in and it's really simple to go in there and, and hit these uh, uh, points, and then we add an R19 bat, and then we make sure all those penetrations are sealed up. You don't want to have any uh, all that cold air running up through the house and out through the attic. And this is my centerfold crawl space porn. This is something that warms my heart every time I see it. Uh, this is what we do. And now we have an R19 sealed rim joist. All the vents are closed up. Now we'll take another R19 four foot high uh, uh, roll of, of uh, fiberglass insulation. We put a radiant barrier on the outside of it, stick that in. We have a vapor barrier underneath. Uh, the vapor barrier not only is it going to help reduce radon, but it's also, even when you have a dry, dusty crawl space, 30% humidity is like an evaporative cooler in the middle of the winter. And again, as we talk about all these penetrations and moving through, it may be only 40 degrees in the uh, crawl space, but with all that moisture, you have a relative humidity that really brings down uh, the temperature. So when you do this, I've, we've done houses where it went from 40 degrees to 75 degrees inside a crawl space using this technique. This should be done on all new builds. Anybody that's into remodeling, this is huge for going into 
uh, high performance levels of doing it. Again, this would be, you know, three, four thousand dollars. Yes, it's additional cost, but it, it really is a huge payback for the homeowner. And this is what I run into when you don't have your vapor bear when it isn't done right. And it's everything from just gutters draining against the wall, people having irrigation, um, they have underground hydrology going underneath the, the house and actually water tables coming up. And so this is, uh, it's not all the time, but it's not unusual. And uh, I work with a mold mitigation company and they, well, they're disaster mitigators mostly, but 50% of their work is they say mold problems. I just worked on a, uh, I worked on an apartment building for the city of Aspen. Dry rot took out the rim joist. Three-story apartment building, had about 25 units. Literally, hydraulically pump it up, replace the rim joist. So to say we don't have mold problems is, is a uh, toss of the coin. It may be, maybe not, depends on what's going on out there. Putting down a vapor barrier is going to take care of any long-term issues. And again, you can see under the footer, water has actually come up under underneath this. But let's get back to it. So we get all the uh, our air leaks done. We're getting ready to do our insulation. So here's all the major insulations. 90, probably 90, 99% of all high-performance homes are based on spray foam or rigid foam. Exterior, interior, uh, but the only thing I can go is the latest from the EPA, the potential for off-gassing of volatile chemicals from spray polyurethane foam is not fully understood and is an area where more research is needed. Now you hear a lot from foam guys that, well, we've taken care of the, all the different uh, fluorocarbons and things that they're using, but now what they're putting in is a lot of fire retardants to, uh, so you don't have to go over and paint it or, or put uh, drywall over it for that fire protection. And those outgas continuously for months to years. They did a test on, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that later. So then below that, we have our cellulose that's blown. We blow cellulose in attics. We like that as opposed to fiberglass blown because it's heavy. If people go up in the attic and and they change electrical or they're, they're putting storage up there or whatnot, it basically keeps its R value. Fiberglass is like down. Once you crush it, it doesn't fluff. So you may have R60, but then you have your uh, electrician or a telephone or a cable guy comes in there and pushes this stuff around, suddenly you're at R10. So that's what we use. Fiberglass fats, as you can see on the lower left, is has a lot of if it isn't air seal it doesn't work fiberglass is used to filter our furnaces not to stop air leaks and then the top left is the rock wool and i'm going to talk a little bit more about that that's my go-to it is the go-to insulation in europe they're probably a generation almost two generations ahead of us on building efficiency so here's the big deal 2015 IECC requires continuous insulation in exterior wall cavities. According to Building Performance Institute, with exterior insulation, thermal bridging is limited, and it doubles the value of the insulation on the interior side. You do not get points from it from HERS. You do not get it from the building department, but we're just talking about the science of it that it, it can double it. So if you have an R19 standard wall, it's now going to be an R38. And so this is what it looks like. Two standard houses on either side. Their windows are opening. They're shoveling uh, dollar bills out the door and windows. And then the, the uh, continuous exterior insulation, you can see there's just it just crushes that heat loss. So the, all the builders run to me and they say, oh, so what you do at these double walls, this is like the big thing. It, and everybody likes the little baubles and these new ideas and they go, okay, let's go do that. But from a builder standpoint, why do I want to build two walls? Why do I want 12 layers on my 
uh, building. It's just added expense. It's a, an added opportunities for failure. So what we have is, created by Joe Stebrick of buildingscience.com. It took him about 35 years to get to the perfect wall. And this is how it's done. On the left, standard 2x6 wall with insulation of your choice. Then you have your OSB and you put your water, air, and vapor control layer all in one place. And then you have your continuous exterior. Uh, you have your little airspace and then you have your facade. So this is what every builder can do. A lot of builders say, well, I don't want to do the extra layer, but compared to doing double stud walls or anything else that's out there, this is quick and easy and everybody knows how to do it. So the big takeaway in all this is it has to be continuous. All the, the air, vapor, and all these level layers have to touch. And you've got to be able to look at your plans, put a pin to paper and say, this is where everything touches. So when you're walking around and checking on your subs and doing this work, you've got all this work figured out. So I don't know about you guys out here, but this has turned into kind of the go-to in, in our valley is the zip system. That I only have, I'm not selling zip, that's just because I have the picture. But the uh, what it has is the uh, water shield, it's air shield, and it's vapor open. So you don't have to do uh, uh, the house wrap. And it's really easy to put everything up together. And with house wrap, I don't know if you've ever seen people doing work on a windy day, or they'll put that up and before they get to putting anything over it, the wind blows or it rains or whatever, and it all falls apart. One thing you need to understand, a quarter inch hole in a wall will allow or in a, in a house wrap will allow a gallon of water vapor into that structure. And OSB is kind of a sponge when it gets water on it, so it isn't, isn't the best thing. Zip system and other systems similar to this, they have a, a really great tape system, so it's pretty easy to do. So what the hell is rock wool? So rock wool was first found by the Greeks, and they used it for insulation. Uh, the Hawaiians use it for decoration, and what it is is that what we do is we use slag from steel manufacturing, so it's a recycled waste product. And what you have was a test that was done uh, by the fire marshals where they took uh, a small test house and they did one with foam, they did one with uh, fiberglass, did one with dense packed cellulose, did one with rock wool, started them all on fire. Fiberglass and foam burnt down immediately. Cellulose was a little bit slower. And then the rock wool, 90 minutes. And this is a certified 90 minute fire retardant um, insulation. Also, it's hydrophobic. Does fiberglass, cellulose soak it up? Problem with foam is it's waterproof. So if you sprayed your ceiling and you sprayed your walls, you get a leak in your roof it's going to just sit underneath, run down, go down your wall, you'll never see it. And I don't know if you've ever run into mold from uh, foam, but I have in places like closet, wine cellars, the basement theater rooms, and things like that. The moisture gets in, hits the, fire, hits the foam, and then it turns to mold and comes back out through the uh, drywall. I, I just did a, a house and we did minimal mitigation. And they take a small uh, piece of uh, uh, drywall where there was the fiber or the mold on it, and they had to go all the way out to the studs until there was no mold. One spot was $6,000 to remediate, not replace and repair just to pull it down and get it out of the building because the remain, remediation with mold is very time consuming and it's very expensive. So, rock wool is right in the middle between foam and fiberglass, both in our value and in price. So, the guy on the fiberglass side says, I don't want to pay extra. But he may be foaming, thinking that's quick and easy, but he's paying a premium for what I consider a 
uh, less than premium product. And as I said, in Europe, this is the go-to insulation that they use. And um, it has uh, lasted through the test of time. Really easy to uh, install. There's a lot of times they put uh, exterior foam board. And what they find out is five, ten years later, the heat build up on the outside walls totally deforms, shrinks, and turns into a mess. This is very stable. It's easy to work with. You'll see the guy is not in, whoops, is not in a hazmat suit, and he can cut this stuff with a butter knife, or a bread knife, excuse me. It slips in, it's a friction. It's slightly bigger than your, than your uh, wall cavity, and they can pop them in the top, in the walls, and it can be used anywhere in the house, so you don't have to say foam board on the foundation, spray foam on the walls, uh, and fiberglass or whatever you do in the attic and you have all these different choices you can work with one product and it's pretty safe and simple uh, throughout the product throughout the process final thing ventilation you've got to have fresh air now the zero energy ready program stipulates only when you get to a really low air filtration layer personally I say just do it there's nothing better than fresh air. If you've ever been in a house that has a HRV or an ERV system, it's just really amazing how, how nice fresh air is. <coughs> so here's a typical, what we think is what's out there. This is uh, uh, one of the major uh, uh, heat recovery ventilation systems that are out there. And you got home runs everywhere in the mechanical. And uh, so they go everywhere. And, uh, and you have to have a heating system besides. So now we've got two full systems running through the house. Incredibly expensive. You got metal ducts, you got plastic pipes, and you got everything everywhere. It just is really tough. So in Canada, the Minotaur uh, uh, company, they do uh, a combination. They have their uh, uh, air source heat pumps where they can actually heat and cool these houses. You can still run the same home runs out of your mechanical rooms. Uh, but if you're really looking at keeping with the old fashioned forced air furnace, your fresh air intake system is a standard uh, for commercial. So this is not unusual for any HVAC guy. You say, I want a fresh air intake, he can give it to you. So it, again, it's a uh, this is not, uh, this is still off the shelf and something that's tried and true for decades. Uh, here's my favorite. This is a uh, Panasonic and it's uh, similar to a bathroom, uh, bathroom fan on steroids. It's about two by two feet or one and a half by three, something like that. It's a, it's a pretty good size unit. It isn't a little bath unit. But the beauty of this is it goes directly through the through your floor joint and uh, outside. So now you look at the five, ten, whatever it is. You're going to place it in a hallway, or you're going to place it in a main living area, and you're going to get your fresh air right there. These run about a thousand to twelve hundred square feet, depending on the layout of the room. If you're talking about big houses, you do them on multiple levels. These things run. Uh, between $500 and $750 plus installation. So this is cheap and easy, and uh, it's highly effective, has humidistat on it, has timers on it, it's all worked out, it's very smart, and it works incredibly well. So I say let's get away from the ducts, let's just go and do radiant. I'm a big radiant guy uh, because uh, doing duct sealing and getting tests getting your ducts tested and finding out they don't pass, oh my God, it could be two, $3,000 bringing in an AeroSeal guy to seal up your, uh, your ducts. So why don't we just go into Radiant? Uh, a lot of people think it's more expensive. It's just a different technique. Once you get it in your tool, tool kit, it's pretty simple stuff to do. Uh, you just want to make sure you do it the right way. This is pretty standard. I run into this a lot. You just kind of nail it up and, and, and throw it into an un, into an unconditioned crawl space. And then they say, why doesn't it work? My floors are still cold, or I'm spending a ton of money. 
But it's so simple, and yes, again, it's going to be a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand, depending on the house. But this improves it by 60%. Radiant over forced air is 30% on its own. We're talking about this huge upgrade because when the floor is warm, we are warm. Forced air with our thermostats at five feet, we've got 80 degrees on top, 70 degrees at five feet, and my feet are at 65. If I put it in the floor, my feet are at 75 degrees. I don't care that it's 60 degrees at the ceiling. I'm warm. My chair's warm. My table's warm. My floor's warm. It's, a, it, it's a, the night and day, and I just really think everybody should really look towards making that to go to for uh, uh, heating homes because you have no noise, you got incredible indoor air quality, makes it really simple to use all these other systems together. And again, doing things, a few simple steps, you can pay for all these upgrades just in your foundation. When you start adding in, using these different financing ideas and putting your, so, your solar all the way through and, and batteries and an EV charger, uh, it really is the home of the future today. And this is what millennials and the new home buyers are, get, are looking for. So just remember, you got an answer for every question. You have program checklists that's going to walk you through the whole thing. Of course, the first couple of times are going to be really tough, but once you get used to it, it's the go-to like you do now. You do everything the same way, house after house. This is only a slight upgrade over the 2015. Become one of the top 1% of the builders. Become the premium builder in your, in, in, in your area. This is, this is uh, a way to improve your sellability and you really become uh, what are the top dogs in your area? So thank you. How'd they do? <laughs> right on time. So, right. So anyways, here, take my name, my number. You can contact me. And if you're ever going through the process, I'm always happy to, to uh, help you with that. And I am available for uh, full home consultations through the whole process getting together hers ratings, things like that. So thank you again. We're just going to see if we can get Nathan from Thrive. The reason why we asked Nathan to be here, can he hear us at all? No, he's not on right now. Oh, okay. Nathan Carr from Thrive Home Builders on the front range. They've done 568 of these certified zero energy ready, DOE zero energy ready homes. And I asked him to speak a little bit to the issues that they had and how they're accomplishing it. I also just wanted to speak to, um, I'd actually written a story to promote this uh, <coughs> seminar to send to the paper, uh, and I talked with a builder called Mantel Hector Builders of Durango, and they've completed 12 certified DOE zero, zero energy ready homes. And um, they- That was the one they had a slide Right, up. they're building from 1,600 to 5,000 square feet, and uh, they have a waiting list of customers of two years and they said that every time they build one of these homes, the appraisal value is always more than the cost of the performance upgrades. Yes. Um, and that, as we're still stalling here, it looks like, I want to pass these around. You guys remember Shauna Mozingo, who came and trained in town for us? Uh, she's working with the Colorado Energy Office, and they're doing a series of workshops. And um, they're free, and they're on Wednesdays. They do, they do them every year. But uh, they've got a couple of cool ones coming up here. Um, they're doing energy conservation construction part one and two. And then they're doing, uh, you changed what? Now look what happened. I really like that one. That's on December uh, 5th. So anyone who's in construction, if you guys are interested in any of this. And we might be able to take questions of Scott while we're waiting on Nathan. I was wondering if you were like the ICF thing. Well, they, 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 yeah, they work, and, and, 